It's Thanksgiving week, and we have so much to be thankful for. Uh, Even in this past week, we can just look back to this past week and be so thankful that Netflix released the final season of The Crown. And (laughs) anybody else excited about that, or is that just me? Anyway, three of you are, and that's great. Uh, Happy Thanksgiving to you. Glad that you're here this morning. I went to, last week I went to the eye doctor and uh, uh, went and just had my regular annual eye checkup. And I've been doing this for over 30 years. I've worn glasses or contacts. It's always funny to me when I wear contacts out in, or when I wear glasses out in public, uh, people are like, oh, did you get new glasses? I'm like, "Mm, no, I've had these since before they were cool. And so I went to the eye doctor last week and, uh, and learned a whole lot about eyes. Uh, I've got a new eye doctor, and so uh, I get there, I show up, I sit down in the chair, and she starts doing all of this like voodoo Jedi trick stuff on you where you're like one or two, A or B, which one is better, and I never know, and it's always hard for me because I'm not a good test taker, but I get to the very end of the test, and, and she puts up two, uh, two different options for me. And she says, is option one better or option two? And I'm like, well, option one, I can't even see anything. Option two, it's crystal clear. Uh, now, you should know that my prescription has not changed in over 25 years. I've been wearing the same glasses for that long. And she says, well, actually, the one that you can't see out of is your current prescription. Your prescription has tra- changed drastically. It was just a simple appointment with the eye doctor shifted my entire perspective. Like I saw and now see a whole new world. In that one moment, everything shifted. And so for some of us in our life, maybe for many of us, If you're anything like me, uh, there are often times where I just need a perspective change in life. I just need to sit down with the optometrist of the word of God so that there's a a bit of a, a perspective shift and gratitude this season, this time of year, has a way of shifting our perspective in ways that other things never can and never will. If we just pause even for a moment now today and, and just think about what we're grateful for. We can just look around the room and we've walked into a space, into a house that nobody's checking our ID and asking us if we're a Christian on our way in. Nobody's regulating our worship this morning, which our worship this morning was on fire. Oh yeah, come on. Oh yeah, it was great. Nobody's, nobody's regulating any of that as we come in. Is anybody thankful for that this morning? Uh, some of you came in this morning with loved ones, uh, with somebody who cares deeply for you, uh, with someone who uh, brings joy to your life. Are you thankful for that? Think about how you got here this morning. Uh, many of you got here in a vehicle that you pulled out of your garage, leaving another vehicle in the garage or in the driveway. You took public transportation. There was a way for you to get from point A to point B. Think about before you drove here, before you got here in some sort of vehicle, you had a home, you had a roof over your head that God has provided. Are you thankful for that? Even the place and the community that we live in, South Orange County, come on, y'all. There are worse places to live in the United States, let alone in the world, and we have so much to be thankful for. And when we just pause, when we just take a minute outside of any season or any holiday with with, uh, fried turkey and with cranberry, can-shaped cranberries, if we remove ourselves from the holidays of, of Thanksgiving and just for a minute say, what are we thankful for? There's something about being grateful that shifts our perspective. But I know, believe me, I know that life gets difficult. Life comes at us at a pace that we can't avoid sometimes. The difficulties of life, the depression that doesn't seem to want to lift, that leads to the despair that we wonder if we'll ever get out of. I know that life 
can be hard. With diagnoses, with difficulties, with trauma, with wounds that seem to consistently and constantly resurface when uh, there's just something that happens in life that brings it all back up. I, I know that life is hard, And so if you're anything like me, there are moments where we wonder if if this darkness will ever lift. And so I want us to go to a a framework that will lay the foundation for us in life, even even life outside of holidays, where we can begin to take ownership of gratitude in such a way that it shifts our perspective. And so this morning, I want us to look uh, to the book of Numbers. It's the fourth book in the Bible Uh, Numbers chapter 13, and let me just kind of catch you up to speed on where the Israelites have been up to this point in history. Uh, The Israelites have just been delivered miraculously from the oppression and the slavery and the abuse and the neglect and the hunger that was at the hands of the Egyptians. Uh, They went through some atrocious, brutal times at the hands of Pharaoh. And God miraculously parted the Red Sea so that he could deliver his people on dry land, which used to be sea. Come on, somebody. Is anybody awake this morning? God parted the waters of the Red Sea so that his people could be set free. That's what he's done for you and for me. And so as God has parted the waters, he's led them out of slavery and into freedom in every day of their newfound freedom that God has provided. God God gives them every single thing that they need. God has provided exponentially in miraculous, huge, impactful ways for his people. And they're just about to get into this promised land, this promised land that God had promised on their way out I'm not only just getting you out of slavery, I'm giving you, bringing you into a season and a place where you can thrive in your life. And right before they get into the promised land, they send out some spies. We gotta check this out. We gotta check God's math. Has he shown his work? Has he he done what he said he's gonna do? And so the Israelites start to send out spies, and that's where we pick up in the stories. The spies have gone to look at the promised land And this is what they find. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 26, they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land with which which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. So these uh, spies, each from each of the tribes of Israel, go into the promised land. They go and see what God has promised, and they see that it is everything and more that God has said it would be. God has has faithfully, once again, delivered on his promise. But they're not only telling God's people about it, they're showing up. Take a look for yourself. This is the fruit that we found. This is what we saw. This This is what we've experienced in the promised land. We came to the land which you sent us, and it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit, verse 28. However, oh man, they're about to, they're about to ruin the whole story. Like, they had the dream job, and then these spies come back and say, yeah, it was great, but uh, yeah, there's something you need to know. It's like you have a Heisman candidate and then your whole season goes to trash. It's like, yeah, but. And that's where they're at. However, the Israelite despise say, the people who dwell in that land are, they're very strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Besides, we saw the descendants of Amok there, Anok there. And so they have this great report, and then they come back and they say, yeah, the people, oh, goodness, they, 
The people there, they're just huge. They're strong. They're, they're cities. Let me just tell you about their cities. They're fortified. They're, they're, they're blocking everyone. They're, they're stopping anyone from trying to come in. I don't even know if we can get into the promised land. I know God told us, but I'm not sure that we can actually get in there because of the cities. And, and let me just tell you, there's, there, those cities are full of the descendants of Anak, to which you're like, I don't know who that is. A new phone, who does? The, the descendants of Anak are there. Let's read on, verse 32. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land, saying that they had spied out, saying the, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim, and we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. Hey, y'all, th- this land had everything that God had said, but uh, I'm just telling you, it's gonna devour everyone. There's cities, it's huge. There's so much trouble, there's so much problem here. The people are like giants and, and we're like grasshoppers to them. Now, now, don't miss this. This is the people group. This is the nation who God literally parted the Red Sea so that they could walk on dry land to find freedom. This is literally the people uh, that God did miraculous signs and wonders just to get them out of Egypt. Do you remember this? He sent sent plague. He, He turned a river of water into blood. Jesus, uh, God sent, God sent frogs for crying out loud. Literally, this is the peop- the same group of people. And this is the group of people who, on a daily basis, had food falling from the skies every single day. This was the people who had experienced God providing. And these spies saw with their own eyes God's incredible provision, the beauty of in the incredible place that he had promised to them. Yeah, but the people are big. Yeah, but the city, it's gonna pose a whole lot of problems for us. Now, before we're too quick to jump on them and say, how could they? We gotta take a look in the mirror. Uh, Because this story isn't just a projection of the people of Israel. This story is a reflection of the people who are in the room, including myself. Because there are moments where we see God doing great things and we experience God doing great things uh, and we still say, yeah, but man, the giants in my life. Yeah, God, I know you've provided for me, but oh, my kids, it, it, it's hard to be a parent. Yeah, I gotta know how you've pulled through for me in this moment, but I don't know if you're gonna pull through me in, for, for me in this. Or on the flip side, we start to think, well, there's, there's no way God could do in my life what God has done in their life. There, there's no way God could use me like he's used them, which is exactly the moment that we've got to go back to the optometrist of the word of God to reframe and to reshape our perspective in ways that we begin to see clearly through the lens of gratitude that God gives us to reshape things. And gratitude helps us to shift our limiting beliefs by the liberating truth of the word of God. Gratitude helps to to, to ground us in ways that yes, things may be falling apart. Yes, things may be incredibly difficult. Yes, things may turn out different than we wanted, but yet there is a God who provides for us. The rains come, the winds blow, but my house is built on a solid rock. That yes, things get hard, but we serve a faithful God that fulfills every promise that he makes. But we get caught up in these limiting beliefs. We we get caught up in our current situation, our our, our childhood, our past, our, our, our current circumstances, the voice in our head, the voices in our home. We get so caught up in these limiting beliefs that we forget the abundance and the goodness and grace from God. And the tragedy is 
when this happens, the tragedy is it's holding us back from God doing in my life and God doing in your life more than we could ever ask or imagine. And there's no more clear and evident and present reality of this than when it comes to our generosity. Now, we've said over this series, you heard it from me, you heard it from Jody, that we don't care about your money. Listen to me loud and clear. I don't want your money. I, I, I'm not here asking. God, God is not wanting anything from your pocket. He's wanting something to come out of your heart because God cares much more about your character than he does your credit score. God cares much more about your heart than he does your finances. But yet, this limiting belief robs us of the abundance of God at work in our life. Because the reality is, we, we don't just live in a consumer culture. So often we are consumed by our consumption. We know what everybody has. Uh, we know what we wish we had. And, and the, the difficulty in that is it's, it's easy for us to get it. We can almost just think about something and then two hours later, it'll show up in a white bag from an Amazon truck. And so we're, we're in this culture and in this reality where it's so easy for us to be consumed by our consumption, which ultimately just consumes us and ultimately makes us, even if we can afford it, it just makes us even more and more self-centered which, friends, is the antithesis of the gospel. It's the antithesis, it's the opposite of what it means to be a follower of Jesus because God has been so deeply and richly generous to us. Look at how Paul says it and look at how Paul frames it in Romans chapter eight. He's gone through this massive theological treatise and Paul gets to Romans chapter eight and says, what shall we say to these things? everything that God has done. What's our response, Paul says? How should we, how ought we to act differently because of what Jesus has done? What should we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You see, Jesus not only modeled for us how to give. Jesus modeled for us how to live generously. But I know that there are times where we're like, I, and I don't know, we, we have these limiting beliefs like I, I can't give a whole lot, so I, I, I shouldn't give anything at all. But listen to me, generosity and living a life of generosity isn't about the amounts that we're able to give. It's not the amount that counts. In fact, Interestingly, Jesus himself taught about this very issue. He addressed this directly, and you may have heard the story. It's a story that uh, you may be familiar with. You may have heard it in a Sunday school class. You may have heard it in a small group, in a church setting. Uh, but there's a story where Jesus is with his disciples, and they're visiting the temples, and he's got all of his boys around him, and, and they just show up at the temple to do a little bit of people watching. And as they show up at the temple... He pulls his guys off, off to the side. They're watching everyone as they're coming in. And this is what happens in Luke chapter 21, verse one. Jesus looked up, he's in the temple. He looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box. Well, how did Jesus know that they were rich? How did the author of this in Luke, how did they know that these were rich people who were showing up to the temple? Well, he knew because of the way that they were dressed and the people who they were traveling with. Let's read on, verse two, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. Well, how did they know she was poor? Well, by what she was wearing and the people that she was with. This person is a widow, she wouldn't have been with anybody. She would have shown up to the temple all on her own. And the story goes that this poor widow put in two small copper coins. You may know these as the widow's mite. These coins are so small that if I were to hold one up here this morning, you wouldn't even be able to see it. These coins were just little pieces and little shards of copper that 
often weren't even worth finishing or rounding off. They were the smallest amount of money in that day. And she takes two of these small, uh, maybe seemingly worthless coins, drops them in, and this is what Jesus says, verse three, and Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. To which, if we're being honest, we say, well, what kind of math is that? (laughs) That's some like Christian common core type of math that Jesus is working there. And and Jesus in the moment would lean into us and say, no, 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 This this is kingdom math. Because the reality is God is not impressed by the amount of our generosity. He's moved by sacrifice. Jesus went on to say in the story that all of these people gave out of all of their wealth. In other words, they had a lot left over. They gave some portion, but this woman gave out of her poverty. She put in all that she had to live. And Jesus frames it this way. Don't miss this. She was the most generous person in the room. Because the reality is, and the truth is, when it comes to generosity, it is not the amount that counts, but the sacrifice. It's that we get to this place that we are so moved by the generosity of God. Uh, that we get to this place that, yes, I may have lost my job, but somehow, some way, God provided for me every step of the way. It's that we get to this place uh, that we start to reframe our thinking uh, that God is faithful, that God is always going to be faithful, and that he'll always provide. Yes, a diagnosis may have caught us off guard, but some way, somehow, I don't understand the details, but God got us through, and God thrived us through that. And that's what generosity asks of us. But we just need a a reframing and a reshaping of our perspective. That we get to this place that we so long to be like Jesus in every aspect of our life, down to every detail in our life. That says, yes, Jesus, you've provided everything. You have sealed and secured my eternity. And what I have from you is from you. And what I now know in my life is that everything comes from you. Uh, does anybody know what, what, what we can take with us to heaven? You know, there's one thing that we get to take with us to heaven. That's people. The only thing that we can take with us in eternity is other people. And so we get to this place where our gratitude has shaped everything about us. Our gratitude for what God has done for us and what God has provided for us leads us to the place where we say, I can't help but be generous with every aspect of my life, in my finances, in my time, in my emotions, in my encouragement. But I gotta be honest with you. If we're going to be generous, it takes a plan. Generous people free decide, decide ahead of time to be generous. Generous people don't wait to be asked. We don't wait for galas and fundraisers. No, generous people have discovered things that are important in life and that there are things that are making a difference around the world. And so it doesn't mean that you don't give sporadically or spontaneously, but those are just the add on. No, generous people have a framework that we've pre-decided an amount to be able to give. Jesus said in the context of money, he said, seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, when something comes your way, we put God first in every way. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. We, uh, we said that the, the, the way that we plan for this, the way that we lead in this is that we give first, we save second, and then we live off of the rest. Let me just tell you, I'm not not inviting you to do anything that I'm not doing in my own life. This is the way that our family lives. But what we've discovered and what you'll discover is that this impacts everything in your life. 
that you'll begin to experience more joy, more peace as you begin to live more generous. And so may we, as we embrace and live a life of gratitude, begin to live more and more like Jesus, more generous in every aspect of our life. Today, we're gonna have a chance to hear some stories of what God does through your generosity, what God does through his church here at Mountain View. So I wanna invite Brick and Marty up as we transition into this moment and into this time of just sharing what God's doing here in our church and in our community. So this is one of my favorite parts of our service that we do once a year. As Gina mentioned earlier, we refer to this as Gratitude Sunday, um, not just because we do one time, one day a year that we're grateful, um, but it's an opportunity for to not just to hear from the stage, but to, but to hear from the congregation. And so what we're inviting you into is we have, we've sliced about 15 minutes or so out of our service. We're inviting you into to share something that you're grateful for that maybe how the Lord's moved in your life throughout this past year could be something with your family, with your work. It really could be anything. We're not, we're not necessarily prescribing it. Um, so just some quick logistics is uh, we'd like you, Brick and I will both be on each side. And, and if, you're, if you feel led or called or inspired to share, we just want you to come around to the side and, um, and come up next to us. And then we'll just alternate back and forth and take turns. And then we all have our gifts, right? You know, scripture talks about the different spiritual gifts and some of you in this room actually have the gift of gab. And so what we're asking you is if you have that spiritual gift of gab, please don't lean into it today. <laughs> so if you see like brick or I like scooching closer to you, that's a sign. Or if you like put a hand on the shoulder, that's another sign. If that doesn't work, somebody's gonna come up and carry you off the stage. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so yeah, so does that make sense? We're not gonna come out to you. We ask you to come up and we would love, it's just such an, a time to inspire when we hear story and we hear testimony. Um, it just, it inspires and it just shows what the Lord is up to. So when you're ready. Good morning. I hate being here. I'm an introvert. I hate this. <laughs> um, it was interesting that on the last song, you saw pictures of a slot canyon. And that has been a symbol in my life um, because it seems like a lot of times we're going through a slot canyon where it's high. It's narrow, it's twisty. Life has tremendous difficulties and obstacles. And um, my wife and I actually had a chance to go to Antelope Canyon outside of Lake Powell, which if you ever get to that area, has a beautiful slot canyon. But the reason I'm bringing up that analogy is um, I had a chance to go through uh, the restoration ministry uh, for the second time. And if you're not familiar with it, it is phenomenal. It's one of the unique things about this church uh, because not all our problems can be solved by a book or a sermon or talking with friends. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they're spiritual, uh, things that only the Holy Spirit can solve. And uh, I lost my dad in April, and I had a lot of baggage. And uh, it, they really helped me. So I just I, I bring that up as a, both a Thanksgiving for this church but also as something that if you've been struggling a long time with something, maybe it's time to check out the restoration ministry. I'm an introvert too. <laughs> nah, everybody who knows me knows that's not true. Um, so I am gonna make this short, sweet, and to the point. I got to choose this family. I didn't get to choose the turmoil that I live with on a day in, day out basis in my family. I don't choose to go through the trials 
and the scary parts and the absolute feeling of not being worth anything. But I do choose to come here on Sundays and spend time with my best friends and a family that I know I love and I feel loved and I feel gratitude from. And this church is my gratitude and my faith in God is the one who has helped me. And I am so grateful and appreciate all of you guys, even you, Breck. I also hate microphones, so here we go. Um, one of the songs we sang earlier was talking about like when the rains come, the wind blow, we're putting our faith in Christ, and um, that's how we get through hard times. And I went through a pretty gnarly season. I just want to encourage you all that even when you know that God has given you an answer, that something is going to change, for, and it every, you'll get through it and all that, it, it might not be in the timing that you had in mind. Um, uh, just to, I don't know how many of you know my story, but I, I went through a period of time where I couldn't even talk to my kids for a year. Um, it was one of those things, there's some issues that happened, and I thought it would be resolved in like two weeks, and it took a year. And, uh, but through that season, it was just sitting in front of my piano, crying out to the Lord day by day, get me through today, and then we'll cut, and help me through tomorrow. And it was just that, day after day. And um, the, some of the people, I, actually, it was a, it was a diff, different church community, but a lot of them are here now, stepped aside me and ha- helped support me through all of that. And so if any of you are in a season that you can't see how you're going to make it through, um, just lean on the community here, lean on Christ, and just take it day by day, and God will be faithful to you. And I am so thankful today I have an amazing wife. I've got amazing two more uh, stepdaughters, and we've got a big, crazy household of eight, and it's amazing, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. So um, praise the Lord. Um, Mine, I think, is going to kind of feel like a dumb moment, but... um um, I think that's the beauty of walking with Jesus and allowing him to be real in your life um, daily as he re-reveals things to our hearts that um, seem like, I, I learned this when I accepted you 15 years ago, um, but I feel like this year, um, even I feel like in the last few weeks, there's just been this new revelation of the very thing we're talking about, of God's generosity and and truly comprehending how, like, it it seems silly to even discuss ways that we can be generous without acknowledging the outpouring of God's love for us and his generosity for us. Like, in his generosity, um, the God of the universe gave his son, that's his generosity, he gave his only child and watched him be crucified and watched his blood be poured out. And when we really sit in that, when I have really sat in that in the last year, my life has been transformed, like my thoughts are transformed, my purpose is transformed, my, my, the outpouring of my heart is transformed because I am, I am so immensely, perfectly loved, and that is transformative in every area, so um, that's something I'm really grateful for, is the continuous um, outpouring of God's love over my life, how I see him restoring and redeeming areas of my heart and my life and my story that um, truly seemed unredeemable, and um, his, his generosity is just literally life-changing, so I'm just so abundantly grateful for that.
Hello, church. Is this on? Yeah, just a little closer. Um, my name is Kathy, and I'm definitely not used to speaking in front of people, but I had a story that I wanted to share, how God has blessed our family to, to no end. Um, a year and a half ago, my mom was found unresponsive and like four or five breaths per minute. Um, she was gray and the paramedics came and when they uh, brought her into the hospital, um, she was unaware that she was even there and she was screaming out in pain and there was nothing they could do for her. And apparently she'd had a heart attack but the cardiologist there never bothered to tell the family that she'd had a heart attack. And um, so they said that she overdosed, and so they gave her Narcan and did all these things to her. Well, what had happened was her, she was on pain medication, but her, uh, or, her things were shutting down. And so was unable to process the, the pain medication, and so that had a lot to do with it, along with the heart attack, because we had lost my dad the month earlier. And that was devastating for her because they were married for 65 years. Long story short, the hospital sent her home on hospice to die. And literally, she just was a body. Um, my sister and I had to cut her hair because it was in knots and we couldn't set her up to comb it. She wasn't eating. She wasn't drinking. Um, Obviously, if you've ever dealt with hospice, you know they weren't right there on the scene. They came, you know, like a week later. But she had her hands clenched, and we had to cut her nails uh, so that she didn't hurt herself. We kept on trying to feed her, trying to, to you know, get her to do something. And um, so the family all came around and um, to say goodbye. And um, we invited the pastor of her church to come who has a great healing power. He's healed a lot of people. Another story. He came and there was about five of the family and the pastor and we all held hands and we were, now mom hasn't really done anything for almost four days now. And he prayed over her and it was a beautiful time. We were all crying and he left. Two hours later, my mom woke up and said, I'm hungry, what's for lunch? <laughs> okay, this was a really rough time for us because we were not, I guess we weren't trusting God like we should have. She had five rallies since then, back in the hospital eight times. Seemed like every time she got out of the hospital, she was worse. She'd catch a flu or, or dehydration. She'd go in for fluids and she'd come home with a cold, which would keep her awake at night coughing. She has struggled, but she is so faithful in the Lord and has so many prayer warriors in her life that she just kept coming back to life. Back to last Thanksgiving, everybody came uh, to the house. We, we just had everyone come and she could barely stand on her walker. She could barely eat, but she was alive. She thanked us all for coming, and this was her goodbye to the world. You know, she was not gonna be around for Christmas. It's been a really rough struggle. Um, she's such a testimony to Jesus that she is my rock. This year, she's walking. She uses a cane, she uses her walker, this may sound funny, but she's actually able to take care of her own no. stuff. Uh, we were bathing her in bed, you know, and this and that, but now she can get into the shower. Um, her mind is super sharp. Her body is not cooperating. She would love to be, she has congestive heart failure. She's had two or three more heart attacks since then. Um, but this year, she's, she's coming to my daughter's house for Thanksgiving, and I just want to let you guys know. <laughs> He's been so good to us. Amen. Great job. Good morning. Uh, my name is Marty Catrone. I'm the other Marty. Um, I want to share with you this morning that I am profoundly grateful for our small group. My wife Pam and I have been meeting uh, with this particular small group for about two and a half years now, ever since we went through the Journey of the Soul series that Todd led off. And... Uh, 
during that series, within a, a very short period of time, like two or three weeks into that series, we addressed the wall. If you remember, if you read that book, those of you that did it, the wall was that moment in time where you question your faith, you hit something really hard in your life, and every one of us in the group got really transparent. And over the next several weeks, we just poured our hearts together, we cried together, and mind you, we'd only been into this for like three weeks. So that launched a journey with this small group that is just so extraordinary. And uh, that group has become our refuge, it's become our foundation, it's become this place where we rightly divide the word of truth, where we do life together. Um, our text thread is the best small group ever when we communicate, and it really is. And it really just took those of us that were willing to be honest and transparent, and then that just launched this beautiful relationship. And we're comprised of this span of ages and, and stages. And we have a, a single young guy, and we've got two young couples that are pregnant, uh, a couple of older couples. I won't tell you who those guys are. But it's just been so rich. And I, I just want to conclude with saying uh, I would be remiss if I didn't encourage you. If you're not in a small group, you're really missing something. I, it's biblical. It's transformative. It's just such an important part of our lives. And Pam and I have been in a small group ever since we were newlyweds. So it's just been a part of our lives, and it has been so rich. So I encourage you, if you're not in a group, join a group. All right, last, last one. Bring it home. I didn't want to go. <laughs> All right, uh, five years, I've watched people come up and share their, their stories. And uh, I wanted to come up, but I never did. But the Holy Spirit put on my heart this morning that there's someone in here. I don't know who it is, but you feel worthless. You feel like, I don't know, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're never going to be anything. But that was me. I used to think I'm never going to be anything. I remember sitting at my mom's house thinking, I'm never going to have a wife. I'm never going to have kids. I'm never going to have an apartment. I'm never going to have anything. God gave me an amazing wife, an amazing stepdaughter, an amazing daughter of our own, a house. God will build you up if you have faith and you give your life to him. And it can't be a half in, half out, cookie cutter, Faith, I used to think that I'm gonna live in sin and on my last day, I'm gonna say, God, I'm sorry, and that's gonna be it. And let me just tell you, that's not God's plan for your life. He's, gonna, he's removed sin from your life and he wants you to walk in purity. And whoever you are, you are loved and I love you. Well done, church. Well done. Um, I love this, uh, this Sunday. It's one of my favorite Sundays. Like Marty said, it's one of his favorite Sundays. Shows the diversity of the body and the beauty of the body and just how amazing our God is working in different ways, in different people, in different times. Uh, but we do have uh, one thing, and, and Carla so beautifully talked about the, the one thing we all can be grateful for, and that's the table that God puts before us in the communion and the fact that God, when, when we didn't deserve it, when we didn't, uh, didn't even, uh, maybe he didn't even know that God loved us, he sent his son. And it's in his son that we have right relationship with him. And on, on, uh, at the table with his family, his closest uh, disciples, he took uh, the body, took bread, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, and he said, this is my blood that's shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we're going to invite the servers up, and we're going to take a time of gratitude. And maybe something was said that, that stirred something in you, or maybe something uh, that, that you wanted to say and you didn't have the, the courage to come up and say, this is a time for us to just commune with the Lord and to, to get right and to say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done in my life. And so um, 
I'm going to pray over communion this morning. God, we thank you for the stories that are represented here um, at Mount View Church in your church body. And Lord, we thank you that no matter what, where we're at, and some of us, Lord, come in just so grateful. And some of us in here this morning are barely mustering up the words to say thank you. But all of us, Lord, are eternally indebted to the price that you paid, sending your son to, to be broken, to be poured out, Lord, so that we can have relationship with you. So, Lord, right now we, um, we come before you and we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your son. And we do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name, amen.